Hello everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I just wanted to start off this video with just letting you guys know this video is going to be a little bit choppy. I've been having a bunch of technical issues. I had to refilm the video twice and then when I did refilm it the second time, one of my files was corrupt and after two days of trying to get the file back, I finally got it back but then half of the clip was missing. So now I need to refilm part of the video. <laughs> once again and I just don't want to refilm the entire thing again because I want to get this video out as fast as I possibly can and I already have the rest of the video edited so just bear with me I really really wanted to do this video and do it well. I did move so things are a little bit different. I did film this video where I was living before so there's gonna be a clip where I come back near the end where I'm back in this setting so just ignore the transition into this background and just listen to the story because I really do think this is a very important one. And with that, I'm gonna send you back to Caitlin from the past and we're gonna get into this video. Hello everyone, welcome back to my true crime channel. My name is Caitlin Malone. I highly suggest if you're interested in true crime that you hit that subscribe button because I post videos weekly and I'd love to see you here every week. Today's case is actually a really big one and I'm not sure how long this video is gonna be but my script for it is super long. I have an iced coffee in hand, I have a water, I am hunkered down and ready to talk about this case. Today we're going to be talking about the case of the disappearance and presumed murder of Kristen Smart and the very, very, very recent, recent as of last week, arrest of her suspected killer, Paul Flores, after 25 years. This is a really big one, so I hope you're ready for it. But this story gives me vibes of like an episode of 13 Reasons Why. Like I could see this entire plot being in that show as its own season. That's how crazy and strange this story is. And all of the like players in this story really give me vibes of characters in that show. Now that is just in my opinion. Let me know down below if you get those vibes as well. That's just the vibes I get from this. In researching this case, I found so many contradictory stories. There's mentions of alleged cover-ups and misconduct, but we do have to keep in mind that most of these are theories or assumptions. It may come out that they are completely true, but I just wanna make it clear going into this that I'm not saying that everything I'm about to say in this case is 100% fact. There have been at least three different sheriffs on this case in the last 25 years. I don't know, it's just, there's a lot of sketchy points I'm gonna bring up. In my opinion, going into this, I think there may be some level of misconduct happening from multiple different agencies, but I will leave that up to you to decide in the end. Now that that is all laid down clear, let's get into the case. So Kristen Smart disappeared in 1996. She was a 19 year old college student at Cal Poly University in San Luis Obispo, California. From everything I researched, Kristen seemed like an amazing person. She was a swimmer, she had a lot of friends, she was very outgoing, and she also had a very good relationship with her family. This case starts taking place on Friday, May 24th of 1996. And that is when Kristen called home to her family and no one answered because no one was home, so she left a message on their answering machine, letting them know that she had some really good news and she'd call them back Sunday to let them know what it was. It was a warm Memorial Day weekend in California at that time. And Kristen, along with three of her girlfriends, ended up leaving their dorm to walk to Fraternity Row to find a party. So it's around 8.30 p.m. at this time when they leave and it ends up that one of their friends flagged them down and this friend actually had a pickup truck, so it was perfect. They didn't have to walk to Fraternity Row. He offered them a ride, so they all jumped in with him. It's noted that they cruised the streets for a few hours and I'm not sure what they were doing while they were cruising the streets if they were just like taking a joyride but they were supposed to be trying to find a party so maybe they just were going like from area to area seeing what would pop up they didn't really have an exact plan they were just seeing what would happen that night and it doesn't seem like they actually ended up finding a party um, but Kristen actually suggested a party that they could all go to apparently a fellow student named Ryan Fell aka he had this nickname of Swampy was celebrating his birthday just off campus this particular frat house was the way it was described seemed like one from the movies I just picture like 21 Jump Street or just any typical college frat party movie. That's what this frat house was. It was noted in the LA Times that this was a mix of testosterone and beer taps that made females less than comfortable. So I'm sure you can picture the scene. And Kristen's friends knew about this frat house, they knew its reputation, and they didn't feel comfortable going there. You know, it just wasn't the scene they wanted to be around, but Kristen really wanted to go to this party. So they ended up dropping her off a couple blocks from the Kappa Chi, which was the fraternity that the party was at, so that she could go party with the other college students like she wanted to. And none of them had been drinking at this point, and it's noted that one of her friends named Margarita Campos said that when they dropped Kristen off, she seemed a little bit upset and a little bit mad at them because they wouldn't go to the party with her. Margarita said Kristen kept saying, you go with me, 
but she didn't want to go. And she told Kristen, you better be careful. Kristen said that she'd be fine, and they all said bye to her. And the rest of them ended up going home. So Kristen makes it to this party at Kappa Chi. Again, people describe it as like a typical college frat party. College students, a beer keg, various other alcohols, a radio blasting music, and then all of the college students having fun. So stories from the party's attendees vary. This is where all the multiple different stories start coming in. Some were saying Kristen was chugging vodka, and others were saying that Kristen wasn't drinking at all. We have to keep in mind that this was a college party. Pretty much everyone would have been drinking, so their recollection may not be very accurate. And at the same time, if you're at a party with a ton of people, you don't have like the foresight to know something is going to happen to someone, you're not really gonna be paying attention to any particular person second by second of what they're doing. So Kristen could have very well been drinking, she very well not have been drinking, and certain people at certain times in the night seen her not drinking and then seen her drinking. So the stories really vary, but it's really anyone's guess, but I think she was at least drinking something. Some of the students that were noted to be at this party were Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis, who would later find Kristen passed out on a lawn, which we will get to in a second. It was also mentioned that this other student named Matt Manzer was at the party who would later go on to become Cheryl's husband, but I'm not really sure why he was mentioned to be there because I don't see his name mentioned anywhere else in this story in this case. If anyone knows, let me know down below. And the star of the show, of course, um, that was also at this party was Paul Flores. Surprise, surprise. Now it's noted that Paul allegedly was one of those types of college students that would go around and like crash parties. And it was noted that uh, Tim Davis apparently heard a loud crash when he was at the party and he looked down this hallway and he seen Paul on top of Kristen. But he said it wasn't anything concerning because they like got up off the ground or wherever they were, they were in a hallway, so I'm assuming on the ground, and they were like laughing and like cracking jokes about it and just like very lighthearted about it. But it was also noted that at this party that Paul, who personally gives me like Chad meme vibes. I don't know if anyone else is feeling these vibes from him when you hear the rest of the story or know about the story once again. But Paul was allegedly seen hitting on multiple girls that night, including girls that had brought their boyfriends and where they were with their boyfriends. And again, in my opinion, this case and the story give me huge 13 reasons why vibes. So it's now 2 a.m. Swampy's birthday party is slowly coming to a close. People are starting to go home. So Cheryl can't find her friends that she went to the party with and she ends up running into Tim. And Tim offered to walk her back to the campus because he actually lived off campus, but he had parked his car there. So he was going there anyways. They were going in the same direction. He offered to walk back with her. But as they left, they actually ended up finding Kristen passed out in a neighboring lawn near the frat house. And this is a little strange because it would be noted by her friends that although Kristen was very outgoing, she wasn't the type of person that would go to a party and get blackout drunk and wake up on a lawn. She wasn't a huge drinker. So Cheryl and Tim find her on this lawn. They get her up to her feet so that she can walk back with them because they know that she lives at the campus. It's noted that Kristen was only wearing black running shorts a crop top and sneakers. And although that was suitable for the 80 degree weather it was during the day, this is very typical of California weather. It can be really warm during the day and then drop during the night. And that is what happened this night. Apparently it had dropped about 30 degrees. It was way cooler out and it really wasn't the weather to be wearing short shorts and a crop top. So Kristen was notably cold. So now Tim, Cheryl, and Kristen start walking back towards the dorms. And as they begin to walk in that direction, Paul Flores pops up out of nowhere and offers to walk with them back to the dorms because he also lives at a dorm near campus. So now there are three students helping Kristen walk back to the campus. So although Kristen wasn't completely blackout drunk, like she was able to walk, it was reported that Kristen was leaning on Paul and she had her arm like around his neck and he had his arm around her waist. And it was also mentioned that Kristen was over six feet tall and that Paul was a couple inches shorter than her. So she was leaning on him trying to, you know, walk back to the dorms and that Paul was like the one that was holding her up while they were walking there. So Tim was the first one to leave their group. They were approaching where the parking lot was where he had parked his car and seeing as Kristen had two other people to walk her back, he felt like Kristen was a good hand. So he departed and left Kristen with Cheryl and Paul. So now it's just the three of them. And in her deposition, Cheryl would note that Kristen and Paul kept stopping. Paul, who was still holding on to Kristen, kept telling Cheryl that, you know, she could go ahead if she wanted. Cheryl reported that she felt this was a little strange and she kept waiting for them to catch back up to her. Paul attempting to get Cheryl to leave him alone with Kristen happened repeatedly through that walk. And eventually Paul got what he wanted because Cheryl was the next to leave. Her dorm was half a block south, whereas the dorms that Paul and Kristen lived in were farther up and so it didn't really make sense for Cheryl to continue to walk all the way to their dorms and then have to walk all the way back to her dorm by herself. But before she left, Cheryl says that Paul asked her for a departing kiss and when she was disgusted and said, hell no, Paul then asked her for a hug instead. Now, 
as I keep mentioning, this reminds me of the TV show, but he just reminds me of these like Chad vibes of these guys that are like, oh, give me a hug. It just seems like he was the person that all of those stories stemmed from. Is it just me? Like, could he become more of a stereotype? But Cheryl still decided to leave and go back to her dorm. Cheryl would be one of the last people to see Kristen Smart alive. So now this part of the story comes from Paul. Paul claims that he barely knew Kristen and that she was heavily intoxicated and that she could barely walk straight. He also at one point admitted that he was carrying Kristen, which was also reported to happen, but that he also was like hugging her throughout the walk to keep her warm because she kept saying she was cold. And most of that was kind of corroborated by Tim and Cheryl. Despite that, he claimed that he walked Kristen back to her dorm and then he went back to his own dorm at Santa Lucia Hall. I think it's Santa Lucia or Santa Lucia. So, one of those. But he says that he went back to his own dorm by himself. But Kristen would never be heard from again after that night. Kristen's family would never receive that call about the good news that she had. And by Monday, with still no call from Kristen, her parents realized that something was very wrong. And during that weekend, Kristen's friends also found it really weird that Kristen was missing. They even multiple times asked the dorm advisor to open Kristen's room because they wanted to see if she was inside because they they couldn't find her, they couldn't get a hold of her. And you have to remember at this time, it was the 90s, no one really had cell phones. It's not like they could have just texted her or called her up and been like, what are you doing? They couldn't find her. She was just not there. And the only place I thought maybe she could be was her dorm room. It seemed like her roommate had gone on vacation for the weekend, so her roommate wasn't home. So there was no one there to corroborate if Kristen was in her room or not. But the dorm advisor ended up refusing to open the door for them. And it wasn't completely alarming until Kristen's roommate came back and they realized that Kristen wasn't in her room, all of her stuff was there, her clothes were there, her purse was there, her wallet was there, everything of Kristen's was there, but Kristen herself. So her roommate Crystal ended up walking around the dorm asking everyone else if they'd seen Kristen, but no one had since early that Saturday morning at the party. And at this point, Crystal ended up making two separate phone calls to the campus police trying to report that something was wrong, but the campus police weren't really taking Crystal very seriously. It just was really unfortunate that this ended up happening on a holiday weekend. So the campus police just immediately said, well, she's a college student. She's an adult at this point. She probably just went off on a vacation somewhere for the weekend and just didn't tell anyone because she's an adult. She doesn't have to tell anyone. As we know, people don't just normally 99.9% .9 of the time get up and leave with none of their belongings, no clothes, no wallet, nothing to go on a vacation. It just doesn't make sense. People don't just do that. But finally, the campus police were bothered enough that they eventually ended up calling Kirsten's parents, asking them if Kristen was over at their home, which was the huge red flag for her parents because Kristen was not with them and they still hadn't heard back from her. And I think the campus police ended up calling them on like late Monday. So this was the final straw for her parents. Kristen's father ended up making arrangements to take some time off work and he went to the campus to help try to look for his daughter. It was noted pretty quickly that Mr. Smart realized that the campus police were not trained to handle a situation like this. Kristen's friend Margarita and some of her other friends ended up helping out Mr. Smart by putting up flyers and asking around if anyone had seen Kristen. Allegedly, Tim Davis was told to call Kristen's parents to let them know what he knew because he was one of the last people to see her, but apparently to this day, he never still has called her parents. Okay, so now it's Tuesday and Kristen's father is in San Luis Obispo looking for her. He tried immediately filing a missing persons report, but he was told that it was too early. I've heard it time and time again in cases where police say it is too early to report someone missing, which is completely false. You can report someone missing after five minutes and honestly, it makes more sense to report them missing after five minutes. You have more of a chance of finding them immediately than hours or days or weeks because at that point, we know the first 24, 40 hours are like the most important time when someone goes missing. But we hear all these cases where the police are like, nah, it's too early. When I don't understand because the parents and the friends of the person would know them better than the police and would know that something is wrong. So I don't understand why police never believe the parents or the friends in these stories. They're just like, oh, they're just off somewhere, like having a good time. Oh, they're off on vacation. Like, oh yeah, Kristen just went off to Miami with no wallet, no clothes, nothing to her name. It's just frustrating. So her father actually ended up also trying to file it with the campus police because I'm a little confused. The campus police are completely different than, you know, the city's police and they like police the campus. It's just... It's, I guess it's like its own little world. I don't know. I'm very confused by that. I thought like immediately, you know, the real police, the police of the city that are trained to handle things like that would take over something like this, but apparently not. Apparently the campus police were the first ones to kind of handle this case. When the father asked the campus police, I guess they tried to contact the San Luis Obispo police and they all again told them it was too early to report her missing, which was 
a huge problem with this case was Kristen was reported missing so late. It took the police way too damn long to file a missing persons report, and it would actually be weeks before it was filed. On top of that, if things couldn't get worse, once this report was written up by the Cal Poly police, they allegedly wrote that Denise Smart, aka Kristen's mother, stated her daughter went on a camping trip, which Denise Smart 100% denies that did she ever said that? Why would she even say that? I personally don't believe that she would have said or wrote that. People that are suspicious of this case theorize that the campus police wrote this to not put any heat on themselves for taking so long to report Kristen missing and to actually like file the missing police report because the campus doesn't want bad press. This is a huge campus and a huge college or university in California and it did not want the heat for that. I could completely see that. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this case, there are a lot of people that believe there is a lot of corruption in this case. And that right there is one of the points that they like to, to make. And there's again, a few other points in this case that I will bring up that will make you really wonder. So it'd be a week or more to file a report and it would also then be a week or more to interview students. Eventually, all three students that walk Kristen back to her dorm would be interviewed. And of course, Paul being the last person to reportedly see Kristen, he would be questioned by campus police as well. Now, at this point, he actually ends up telling campus police from what I figured out because there's gonna be so many different versions of the story that he actually didn't walk Kristen back to her dorm he actually walked to his dorm and then let Kristen walk the rest of the way to her dorm and he watched her walk there what a gentleman and on top of that he showed up to this interview with a black eye and scratches on his arms but in the end campus police concluded that there were no indications of foul play so considering the black eye the scratches Kristen's disappearance and all the weird statements that were starting to be said they didn't seal off Kristen's room they didn't seal off Paul's room they didn't seal off anything they didn't call in a CSI team to investigate anything they didn't call like the actual sheriff's department saying hey something's up here this girl's missing this kid's showing up with a black eye that was the last one to see her and these scratches and his story is a little weird now instead of investigating Kristen's disappearance it seems that the campus actually called in cleaning crews to sanitize some dorms, and you would guess it, Paul's would be one of them. Before we get into more of the suspicious circumstances and the timeline of events that would lead up all the way till present day, I just wanted to tell you a little bit of information that I found out about Paul. In December of 1995, Paul Flores was apprehended by the San Luis Obispo police. He was suspected of being a peeping Tom and attempting to break into an off-campus apartment of a co-ed by climbing her balcony. Police noted that he was intoxicated and advised him to leave. I think it was also mentioned at some point that Paul also had multiple DUI I'm not sure how many at this point, but it was mentioned that he had some DUIs. Then on March 27th of 1996, so a few months later, at the same apartment that Paul allegedly attempted to break into, the three students that lived in that apartment reported to police that they were receiving harassing phone calls, sometimes as many as eight a day. And when they'd answer and they'd say hello, the person on the other end would just like hang up. The students end up telling police that they suspect it is Paul Flores because he was the one that had attempted to break into their apartment a few months earlier. And I'm assuming they just had some sketchy vibes from him because I I have sketchy vibes from him and I've never met the man. Despite all of that, the Cal Poly Police Department was never notified of any of this. And I'm assuming because this all happened off campus, but it really makes you wonder after what we know now. So fast forward back to Kristen's disappearance. So it would take about a month before the campus police realized that they are not equipped to handle this case. I don't know why it took them a month to figure that out. But instead of handing it off to the San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Department, they ended up handing it off to the DA's department, which makes little to no sense because the DA is who the police take their information to, to like get warrants and to, you know, they work through the DA with their evidence that they end up collecting. The DA normally doesn't just handle cases right off the bat as far as I know, don't quote me on that. Either way, things finally start moving along once the DA gets a hold of this case. Like it, I just can't believe it took a month though. So the DA investigators end up re-examining all of the transcripts that the Cal Poly police ended up collecting from the interviews that they conducted with Cheryl, Tim, and Paul. And they ended up calling them all back in for their own interviews. So on June 19th, they call Paul in, which is about a month after Kristen's disappearance, and Paul ends up changing his story, surprise, surprise. Specifically the story of how he got his black eye. He allegedly said he didn't know how he got it, then he said he woke up with it. Then he had this other story that his friend elbowed him during a basketball game. And after all of that, Paul then says he was lying about it, all of those stories because his real reason for getting the black eye was super lame and that he actually got it while he was trying to install something in his car and he hit his face off of the steering wheel. But either way, after 
10 different versions of the story of how he got a black eye. Fellow students would tell police that Paul had that black eye the morning after Kristen's disappearance. And he also apparently would wear shorts a lot and they noticed that he had scrapes on his knees as well. So Paul's got a lot of stories clearly or just a really bad memory. He can't remember how he got a black eye. He can't remember if he walked Kristen to her dorm or he watched her walk by herself. He just must really have a bad memory, right? So they're very suspicious of Paul, as they should be. At this point, the DA wants him to submit to a polygraph test, which Polygraphs are really controversial, I get it. But they wanted him to do this. It's a good baseline to tell if someone's lying or not. Paul agreed to it, but then he kept putting it off. So the investigators to the DA's office finally have enough. They decide, okay, we're just gonna pick him up. So they pick Paul up and take him to this conference room at the Arroyo Grande police station. Paul reportedly bulked and turned white when he realized that he was gonna have to take this test now. The only thing I see noted about this polygraph was that during the 90 minute interview, Paul allegedly admitted to going to the dorm's communal showers around 5 a.m. after he had become sick. At one point, they actually thought that Paul was going to confess during this interview but then the interviewer ended up asking him a question he didn't like and he blew up and he basically was like if you think you're so smart then you tell me where the body is and then he stormed out of the interview that didn't go as planned before we get a little more into this investigation I just want to bring up a few strange points that I seen mentioned these are some of the points that I mentioned at the beginning that are Alleged, I'm not 100% sure any of them actually really did happen, but I've seen them mentioned a few times in different articles and different retellings of this. And so I don't know for sure if they're 100% true, but if they are, they're very strange. I've seen it come out that apparently an electrical golf cart and two car covers were stolen off campus the night that Kristen went missing. Unsurprisingly, Paul worked for a department of the campus that used several of the golf carts. So it's theorized that if Kristen was murdered, someone could have used a golf cart to take her body off campus because a golf cart is a little more discreet than a car. It can go over grass. And it was also mentioned at one point because of Paul's DUIs that he might not have been able to drive his vehicle. So if something happened, how else would her body be removed from campus. But it was mentioned that when this theory came out that a bunch of students that were on campus admitted that they were the ones that stole the golf cart to go for a joyride and then they like dumped it on a road and the police actually ended up finding it on a road. I'm not sure if it was the same road that the students mentioned but it was found eventually. The strange thing is though, when the San Luis Obispo police ended up finding this golf cart and bringing it back to campus, the students that worked for like the maintenance crew were advised by their supervisor that they needed to thoroughly sanitize this cart. And when they weren't cleaning it fast enough, the supervisor took over and completely sanitized the cart. But again, we have to remember these facts are hearsay and they aren't like solid, concluded facts by the police. Once the trial happens, I'm very interested to see what actually comes out and what facts are true or not. So there's also a rumor that the coworker of Paul's mom said that Paul's mom told her in the middle of the night, the same night that Kristen went missing, Paul called their house and the father answered. And after the father talked to Paul on the phone, he took off like a bat out of hell. Police apparently didn't feel like this phone call was important. I don't think the police ever requested the phone records. I could be wrong though, let me know if I am. Another report said that two days after Kristen's disappearance, the Flores family was pouring concrete in their backyard of one of their homes. There is also a rumor that a neighbor said during the night that Kristen went missing, they looked out their window and seen Paul and another man at the East Branch Street House because we will find out that they have multiple different homes. But this is the East Branch Street House. Paul and another man were digging holes at the home and then putting something heavy into the hole and pouring concrete on it. And another neighbor said the weeks after her disappearance, there was constant construction at that home. On top of that, there's another rumor that Paul's roommate said that Paul confessed to him saying that he killed Kristen that night and that her body is at his mother's house and that her body was still there. Are all these people just making things up for the sake of it or is there some truth to this? So it took about a month and a half-ish for three cadaver dogs to be brought into the campus, which I think is a long ass time. I think that's way too long. I think they should have been brought in immediately, but that is just my opinion. Handed it off to the DAs and then the DAs had to restart the whole case over again pretty much. And then the DA finally ended up handing off to the San Luis Obispo Police Department and specifically to Sheriff Ed Williams. So the actual Sheriff's Department didn't get a hold of this case till about a month and a half after Kristen went missing. And Sheriff Williams ended up by bringing in the cadaver dogs to the campus. Each of the three cadaver dogs ended up tracing all the way back to Santa Lucia Hall and specifically to room 128, which just happens to be Paul Flores's dorm room. And they specifically hit at a garbage can, a phone in the room, and then the end of Paul's bed. I've seen that they took a part of the mattress and then they also took the complete mattress out of the dorm room and the dogs still continued to hit at that dorm room. And we also have to remember that this dorm room had already been sanitized by the campus. So even though it was sanitized, the cadaver dogs were still hitting at that room, which has to mean that either whoever was in there 
touched a dead body or a dead body was in that room. But due to it being sanitized, it seemed like CSI couldn't find any other evidence in the room. They couldn't find like hair or blood or anything like that or fluids, I guess, which is suspected to be because of the sanitization that happened. So finally on July 15th of 1996, police would conduct their first search of the house of Ruben Flores, which is Paul Flores's father. So as I mentioned earlier, they owned multiple homes and this was the White Court home. They also had a second vacant property, which is the East Branch Street home, which they use as a rental property. And that was the home that a bunch of neighbors mentioned that they seen construction at, as well as like holes being dug up and stuff. So we could think that maybe they were just renovating it for a new renter. So the police end up searching the White Court house. The only thing noted to be found in the search were some newspaper articles underneath a bed, but it seemed like police were looking for more so hard evidence, like a body, a murder weapon, something that could lead to an arrest, something to like easily prove that the Floreses were involved. Now, this is another instance where people believe that doing this for kind of show to kind of shut up the smart family and to kind of prove to the smart family like oh it's been a month or so but you know we're doing something and that is mainly because they didn't search the vehicles at the home. They didn't bring in cadaver dogs. They didn't bring any ground penetrating radar in. They didn't really bring anything in to try to find evidence. They kind of just did like a sweep of the house. They asked around and it would actually be years before the police end up asking Paul to see his pickup truck. And Paul would end up telling them that it was stolen. But I don't think Paul ever reported it as stolen. But keep that in mind for later in the case. November that year, Kristen's family ended up filing a lawsuit for the death of their daughter against Paul Flores. And they did this because they didn't feel like the police were really doing anything. It's noted that during the deposition, when the Smarts family's attorney asked Paul if he attended that party off campus on May 15th, Paul responded that on the advice of his attorney, he was not going to be answering any questions. And basically he just kept pleading the fifth. Uh, Paul Flores, a defendant in Smart versus Flores, San Luis Obispo Superior Court case. In May of 96, were you a student at Cal Poly? On the advice of my attorney, I refused to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment the United States Constitution. What is the name of your father? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. Were you arrested for uh, driving under the influence of alcohol in 1996? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. So now Paul was completely refusing to admit that he even attended the party that Kristen was at that night. But without any evidence, the case was eventually dropped. I'm not 100% sure if that was exactly why it was dropped, but the lawsuit was eventually dropped. And once that lawsuit was dropped, Paul's family actually ended up suing Kristen's family back for emotional distress on Paul. And considering what's happening now in current times, that is absolutely fucking disgusting. That is just so gross to think that they sued Kristen's family for emotional distress on poor baby Paul. Like, ew. Okay, and it wouldn't be the Kristen Smart case if we didn't mention the disappearing earring. So the disappearing earring is a huge point in this case I've seen brought up time and time again. A few weeks after Kristen's disappearance, the Flores family ended up renting out that East Branch Street home. And the new tenant of that home ended up finding a turquoise earring outside of the home and reporting it to police. Now I've seen Two different versions that she was cleaning her car and she ended up finding the driveway. I've seen it also mentioned that she found it in the backyard. So I'm not too sure where she found it, but she found this earring at the home and she brought it to the police and it was said to have been placed in an evidence bag and marked as a potential exhibit. But other sources also say that it was never bagged as evidence. So again, back with the multiple different versions of stories. Either way, it was never confirmed to be Kristen's earring because the police never told Kristen's family about it. The Smart family actually ended up finding out at a deposition when the tenant of that home brought it up and asked if they ever found out if it was Kristen's earring or not. And of course, Kristen's family was like, what earring are you talking about? And when Kristen's mother was given a description of the earring, Kristen's mother said it matched the description of Kristen's favorite pair of earrings. And those earrings were never found with her belonging. After this, the smarts were understandably extremely furious with the police department and they demanded to see the earring because they wanted to identify if it was Kristen's earring for sure. But they were denied on multiple different occasions until finally they were angry enough that they actually drove all the way to the police department and showed up there and demanded to see the earring. And when they did, the police ended up telling them, well, you can't really see the earring because we lost it. You heard me. The police lost a crucial piece of evidence. And that could have been amazing evidence to arrest someone. Again, this is another reason mentioned why people think that this case was botched or that there was cover-ups happening because 
how do you just lose a very crucial piece of evidence? And on top of that, there was never any investigation from what I found to figure out who lost the earring, why it was lost, and no one was reprimanded for it. So I've also seen it noted that there were multiple searches done on the East Branch Street home. Again, more instances where there's conflicting stories and confusing different narratives, I don't know. But at one point I read that Graham Penetrating Radar was brought in and they searched the yards, but nothing was found. Another article stated that they brought cadaver dogs in and they hinted at a flower bed in the backyard. Again, although I've heard that cadaver dogs were never brought in, so I'm not sure. I also read somewhere that later on, someone else would go in to check out the backyard and they ended up finding broken up pieces of concrete and dirt staining the side of the house. And from that, the person concluded that dirt must have been piled up there for the dirt to be staining the side of the home like that. And they really did believe that because of the concrete broken up and this dirt, that something was unearthed. So it led people to speculate that if Kristen was murdered and her body was there, that it was unearthed and moved somewhere else. But despite if cadaver dogs were brought in or Grand Penetrating Raider was put there, police did not want to dig up that backyard. And why you ask? The big reason I seen was that they didn't want to dig up this backyard because the police didn't want to have to pay to repair the concrete if they dug it all up and nothing was found. Again, I don't know if that was just an excuse so they didn't have to dig up the backyard because something was being covered up in this case, um, again, allegedly, or if they just really didn't have any solid evidence for the DA to give them a search warrant to dig up the backyard. That earring would have been a great reason for them to be able to dig up the backyard. So another search was conducted in 2007, but again, they say nothing was found. So flash forward a little bit, on the sixth anniversary of Kristen's disappearance in 2002, Kristen was officially pronounced dead. And this was done because her body was never discovered. It happens quite often um, in cases, especially ones that go cold, that the person will be pronounced dead after a certain amount of time if they don't find a body. But somehow this case never turned into a cold case. And that's what gets me. I can see how a lot of people say that there was a cover up happening here or um, corruption happening there. And I've seen a lot of cases where that may be fact, but most of those cases turn into cold cases. And this case, even though it happened 25 years ago, it never turned into a cold case. So if someone has a solid answer for me on that, I would really like to know. I did mention that there were three different sheriffs that handled this case now, whether the first couple sheriffs. As I was just saying in the previous clip, there were three different sheriffs that handled this case. Now, I'm not 100% sure, I'm not saying any of this is fact, but it seems that the first two sheriffs were not fully invested in solving this case. I'll put it that way. Um, and it wasn't until this final sheriff took over that things really started being put in motion. Now, I could be completely wrong and there might've been things behind the scenes that were happening that we just don't know about, but what it seems like, especially for the people that think that this case is a little on the sketchy side is that things weren't completely ramping up until around 2011 when this new sheriff took over. Either way, if anyone knows anything, please let me know because if I've learned anything from this case, it is that it is damn confusing. So as I mentioned in 2011, Ian Parkinson became the new sheriff of San Luis Obispo and he is the one that put in a request for full review of the physical evidence in Kristen Smart's case. As I stated a million times, I'm not really sure, but this is where it seems to be a turning point and where things finally started happening in Kristen's case that are eventually going to lead to these arrests. So now we're going to jump ahead to 2016 and this is when the San Luis Obispo police backed up by about 25 FBI personnel announced that they were going to be bringing in cadaver dogs and searching the area around Cal Poly campus. After three days of searching they ended up coming up with multiple bags of evidence in multiple different dig sites around a hillside that was near where Kristen's dorm was. And I seen also at this time that Paul Flores was arrested for what is said to be his fourth DUI around this time. Unsurprising at this point. In 2019 several new witnesses were were interviewed and these interviews led police to secure a court order to intercept and monitor Paul Flores's text messages and cell phone. Then on January 29th of 2020, so just last year, there was another break in the case. The police confirmed that two trucks owned by the Flores family were taken as evidence, which if you remember back to when I was mentioning that it took them like over a year or a year to ask Paul about his pickup truck at the time and then he said it was stolen. I'm really curious if one of these trucks is the truck that Paul said was stolen way back in the day. So they're taking these vehicles two decades later, and I'm very curious if there would still be any evidence in these vehicles two decades later. But it seems like they are finding evidence, so. And that is because about a week later, search warrants were served for specific items of evidence in four of the Flores' properties. Two were in San Luis Obispo, one was in Washington State, and one was in Los Angeles. I'm really curious about the Washington State one because it can be very rural in Washington State. So if they're looking there, 
who knows. Um, it said that Paul Flores was actually detained once again, but then he was released. So I'm not really sure what that was about, but clearly it seems like at this point they were determined to solve this case. And then a few months later, evidence from those previous searches ended up leading detectives to serve additional search warrants at Paul Flores' home in San Pedro, California. Multiple items were collected during the search as well as computers. And during the search, officials said that they ended up finding evidence related to the murder of Kristen Smart, which is absolutely incredible. So I'm gonna send you back off to Caitlin from the past. She has the information you've been waiting for. So see you there. So now it's February 11th of 2021. Paul Flores ends up being arrested by the LAPD on suspicion of being a felon in the possession of a firearm while in the nearby city of Los Angeles. This arrest leads to a second search warrant being performed and conducted on Paul's home on March 15th of 2021. Cadaver dogs and ground penetrating radar was used once again. An older model Volkswagen was also seized from Ruben Flores' home after cadaver dogs searched the vehicle. So that's interesting. Sometime in March of 2021, another search warrant was issued for Ruben Flores' home, and it is also noted that he is about 80 years old at this point. And I'm guessing this is the White Court home, unless he ended up buying another home and lived in that home. But he was living in the White Court home when Kristen went missing. And once again, investigators used ground penetrating radar and cadaver dogs during the search warrant as well. And additional evidence was found during the search. And then finally, after 25 years, Kristen's body has still not been found, but a San Luis Obispo Superior Court judge finally signed two arrest warrants and two search warrants following the evidence found in Ruben Flores' home. And then, the moment everyone's been waiting for, on April 13th of 2021, so just last week, Paul Flores, who's now 44 years old, along with his father, Ruben Flores, were taken into custody by the San Luis Obispo Police. Finally, in relation to the disappearance and murder of Kristen Smart. Paul is currently being charged with Kristen's murder, and Ruben is currently being charged as an accessory. And this was a theory from years and years ago when I first seen this case told and researching the story and telling you guys the story once again, it's just so blatantly obvious, at least to me and to many other people, that they should have been arrested so much earlier. After 25 years, they've finally now been arrested. And it's just crazy that it's finally coming to fruition. On top of that, a press conference came out the very next day and they said in this press conference that they suspect that Kristen was killed during an RAPE in Paul's dorm room and that Ruben Flores ended up hiding the body. So Paul's original story about sending Kristen off to go to her dorm or walking her to her dorm probably never happened. And on top of that, and this is fucking scary, so if you're standing, please sit down. They reported that they believe that they have evidence that there are multiple other victims in the Southern California area. You heard me correctly. If Paul and Ruben hid Kristen's body this well, how many other victims could be out there? Especially if the police are saying they have evidence that there could be more. And you have to remember it's been 25 years. Like, could they have just caught potential serial killers? That is a huge question that's on my mind. And it just doesn't seem like a rookie murder that they hit her body this well. And clearly the police don't believe it either. Like, just imagine how many bodies could be out there. They still haven't found Kristen's body till this day, but the police are hopeful that they have enough evidence that they will find her body soon. So on April 15th, so a couple days ago, Paul and Ruben ended up making their first court appearance, but they did not enter pleas during this court appearance. And we begin with a man accused of killing a Stockton teenager nearly 25 years ago, making his first court appearance virtually today. Good afternoon, I'm John Dabkovich. The hearing lasted only a few minutes in San Luis Obispo County. Neither Paul Flores, seen in the upper left box here, nor his father, Ruben Flores, on the center right, entered pleas during the hearing. Paul Flores is facing felony murder charges in the death of Kristen Smart. His father is charged as an accessory for allegedly helping him move Smart's body. The hearing, though, was continued until Monday. Then on April 19th is when they finally entered their pleas and unsurprisingly they entered the plea of not guilty. Paul is currently being held without bail but apparently Ruben is going to have a bail set for his release. And finally the most recent update I found was for on April 20th. KCRA News said a document filed Monday and posted on social media by San Lo Obispo area reporter reads that the body of Kristen Smart which still has not been found was recently moved from the home by Ruben Flores. This is wild. Was her body there this whole time and just recently moved or was it moved way back then and then moved again like 
this shit's wild. Like, was her body actually at one of those homes this whole entire time? And the police just never went and brought cadaver dogs until recently. So those are the final updates that I found, like the most recent ones. Once more information's come out, I will definitely make some update videos on this case. This is huge. Um, and once there's a trial and everything, of course, I will, you know, make more videos concerning this case. So if you're not subscribed and you do want to see updates on this case and you're interested, please hit that subscribe button as well as a thumbs up button. Yeah, this is just wild. I just remember this case leaving such a bad taste in my mouth and everyone just being so upset over it because it just seems so blatantly clear. Like naysayers, including the Flores family who went and sued Kristen's family back when they literally were the ones responsible or allegedly the ones responsible. Everyone's innocent until proven guilty. But I just can't believe they went and sued Kristen's family back. And now look, look who's arrested, huh? Like, it's so gross, just so gross. Either way, this case has me heated, but I'm just so, I'm just so happy that there finally have been arrests made. It's been way too long. And I just really feel for Kristen's family, I know they, they have to be so overjoyed that this is finally happening after 25 years. With that, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you're still interested in watching some other true crime videos, definitely go check them out on my channel. I have a whole bunch more. And yeah, I will see you in my next video.